Thank you, Bob, for the wonderful introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here for the, uh, for the special lecture here. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about global change. Uh, so what is global change? Well, you know, if you look at uh, some recent trends, uh, population of the world was fairly stable for many, many decades and centuries, and then over the last few decades, it's rapidly started increasing, uh, becoming about 7 billion a few years ago hoping that it will saturate around 13, 14 billion. We have been going through a rapid uh, process of industrialization and modernization. Uh, we have seen advances in uh, transportation, agriculture, manufacturing, <clears throat> healthcare, and so forth, which is actually, so many of these are responsible for the uh, population growth. People are living better and healthier and, and have more food to eat. <clears throat> We have been, of course, as we are, uh, the societies have been urbanizing, the standard of living has been going up. And as we uh, try to improve the standard of living, we are converting land from forests uh, to, for use for living spaces and for agriculture. The other trend we are seeing is the climate change. <clears throat> uh, some of you may remember last May, uh, this was a national, international news, CO2 levels reached uh, 400 uh, in May of 2013. Uh, that's the blue dot uh, on the screen up there. Uh, and that's significant because for almost a million years, they have fluctuated under uh, 280 parts per million. Uh, and the levels that we are talking about today have never been seen uh, for many, many millions of years. And if you do nothing, you see that upward trend. The, the, the upward climb is actually very rapid. Uh, and that's what sort of is very striking, that it's within 100 years, which is really instant uh, in, 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 in a big scale of time, we're going to walk up the CO2 wall. <clears throat> We're already seeing impact of this in uh, the last few decades uh, in terms of uh, increasing temperatures. Um, the global average temperature has gone up by ab about a degree. Um, and the projections on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the screen are sort of telling us that if you wait for another 100 years, do nothing. What would happen if you do something? What would happen? And, and we're seeing impact of some of some of the impacts already in melting glaciers and, and other changes. We're also seeing, uh, as a result of many of these things, uh, events like oceans are becoming acid, acidified, wetlands are re reducing, impact of monoculture, uh, some evidence the cyclones may be getting stronger, uh, fires uh, are becoming more frequent. Certainly, floods and droughts frequency have gone up uh, in different parts of the world. <clears throat> so this is global change and, um, and, and, and sort of what is um, very important for people to understand is how these different components are impacting each other. How is the, um, uh, the, uh, the evolution of the society uh, over the last a couple of hundred years or, or, or a thousand years or 10,000 years since uh, um, uh, farming practices began, how has it changed uh, uh, the globe? Actually, many of the people are calling this recent period to be Anthropocene. You know, the Holocene is, is being now called as Anthropocene in the sense that if you watch, if somebody was watching the, the, uh, the, the Earth as it's changing, you would normally see changes in the Earth at, at millions and millions of years. It will look different at 65 million years ago, 10 million years ago. But over the last few thousand years, it has gone through such a rapid change that people would sort of call this, this, this was the impact humans made. So it's the Anthropocene is the, is the new term being, being coined. How is that uh, impact in the climate and the, uh, the environment, the biodiversity and, and, and so forth, how uh, the climate is impacting some of these events like uh, uh, natural disasters, like fires, floods, and so forth, how the fires may be impacting the climate change. So there's a lot of interrelationships here. And you may sort of say, well, you know, this uh, what is in it for a computer scientist to sort of talk about. And again, the, it, all of this becomes related to computer science, and I guess in some sense to geographers, because this is all about data. And the global change has become a big data problem, <clears throat> uh, especially over the last uh, four or five decades, uh, because of the advances in technology, uh, computing technology, sensor technology. Uh, storage technology, all sorts of data is being collected and monitored and, and stored. Data from the satellite, you, know, you see the animation here, uh, just from the satellites launched by NASA, uh, uh, sort of showing you how many of them are in, uh, in the orbit at a given time. You're seeing uh, data coming out of the, the models uh, uh, on the top uh, right corner, and these models are getting more and more sophisticated in being able to emulate 
uh, uh, simulate the, the environment uh, uh, of the Earth. <coughs> Reanalysis data, and of course, we have, and, and you're of course familiar with things like population data, air quality data, river discharge, and so forth. There are all sorts of data that are becoming available. And these large data sets offer tremendous opportunity <coughs> for big data uh, research, uh, big data methods. Uh, and, and many of these big data methods you're aware of have had tremendous impact on our life. If, you, if you're using Facebook, if you're uh, uh, using Google, and who doesn't, um, Amazon, all of them are driven by the big data. I mean, they won't be able to make money if they didn't have the big data technologies. So <clears throat> now increasingly over the last, uh, 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 last few decades, scientists, scientific communities are realizing that, of course, we're all, as scientists, we work with data, but as the data gets larger, we have to sort of look at this data in, in a different way. The biologists, of course, have, um, biology has gone through a transformation uh, with the genome sequencing and the high, th high throughput technology. And, and more now in the climate and environmental research, people are realizing that it's the climate change research is also becoming a big science, a comparable magnitude, complexity and importance to human genomics and bioinformatics. So, so this, this is calling sort of for the excitement and in computer science, there is sort of this feeling that perhaps these new data intensive uh, scientific methods are so different that it's just worth distinguishing from as a fourth paradigm of scientific dis discovery and exploration, experiments and theory being the first two paradigms, computer simulations being the third leg, and the data driven approaches being the fourth paradigm. And again, sort of this is sort of showing you the excitement around these areas. <clears throat> now, this work that I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is uh, sort of a, is highly interdisciplinary, has a lot of uh, collaborators, and as Bob mentioned, uh, one of the, uh, the sources of funding for this project is this NSF expedition in, on, on understanding climate change, involves multiple universities and a large number of faculty investigators um, at this university. One of them you, you heard at the panel this morning uh, at, at noon, Shashi Shekhar. Um, <clears throat> And I'm just giving you a very uh, a small sample of, of some of these projects. I will go into a couple of these things in greater detail that I think would be of more relevance to you. Uh, <clears throat> and, and again, the, this, these projects are very diverse. Uh, they look, they range from looking at the ocean, uh, data from the ocean, uh, oceans. Uh, the, the top left corner is looking at the, the sea surface height data from the satellites and trying to analyze the, the, uh, the patterns of, of they call eddies, and these are like the storms in the ocean, and then how they evolve, how they change, and how they impact uh, the, the climate in, in various ways. In the top, um, uh, in, in the bottom left corner, uh, you're looking at analysis uh, of um, interrelationships between uh, different climate variables, how the ocean temperature may be impacting climate elsewhere, how do you find new teleconnections um, uh, that are not known to climate scientists, how do you find better versions of the ones that are known to people, and so forth. On the right side uh, are, 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 are several projects we have on uh, land cover dynamics and change, and that's what I'm going to spend a lot more time on uh, in a minute. I just want to sort of highlight the fact that this project uh, that, that we're going to talk about are these are uh, this is highly interdisciplinary, involves people from multiple disciplines, and as computer scientists, we are used to publishing papers in computer science journals, but these uh, the results from these uh, research uh, are, high, are published in journals that are sort of across the discipline. So you can learn more about uh, the project and various collaborators on, on the website here. But I'm going to sort of focus most of my talk on, on this topic just to sort of um, uh, keep it uh, re more relevant to the, the audience here. So um, uh, we are interested in looking at how the land cover has been changing over a period of time. And this is a sample of kind of changes that one may be interested in. You know, the, uh, there are fires that sort of, uh, the, that burn in the forest, many of them for natural reasons, many, and, and, and there's some concern that they, their frequency may be changing because of human impact or because of climate change. There's a tremendous impact of agriculture. You see in the middle, uh, the, the top middle row here, uh, vast um, amounts of forests uh, in the Amazon being converted for soybean farming. And then you can sort of see the scale of these farming practices by see how, how, you know, by the number of tractors they have to sort of work with or uh, these machines. 
Uh, on the top right side, you see the mountain top mining in Virginia and, and so forth. So these are um, uh, a range of, of changes that are happening. And, and, and one of the research uh, objectives one could have is what are these changes? You know, for example, maybe interested in forest ecosystem changes. Uh, how is the agriculture uh, uh, is changing around the world? Uh, uh, where, is, where is expanding? Where is being intensified? One may be interested in uh, monitoring <clears throat> The surface extending variation of water bodies. You, know, uh, you see the in the top uh, in the bottom right corner. You see shrinking of Aral Sea for uh, over a 40-year period. One of the largest uh, freshwater lakes uh, in Asia sort of came down to almost nothing. Uh, it's, 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 it's a shadow of its past. <clears throat> so how would we sort of uh, uh, how could we sort of look for um, uh, uh, these changes? And if we, especially if you want to study these changes on a global level, we have access to the remote sensing of uh, data from the Earth observing satellites. And one of them uh, is uh, on an uh, instrument called MODIS on um, satellites called Terra and Aqua, which were launched. The program was approved about 20 years ago by the US Congress. And um, the satellites went up and became operational about uh, almost 15 years ago, February 2000. And since then, they have been collecting data literally terabytes a day. And the great thing is that this data is available to public at large, worldwide, free of cost. Uh, so this is the act of generosity by US Congress that has tremendously impacted uh, the um, uh, scientific research in this area. So you see the, the animation of the, the MODIS uh, uh, instrument taking picture of the Earth uh, on one of the satellites. And as a result of this, every single spot in the world is pictured at least once every day. <clears throat> there are some places that will be pictured multiple times, but every day there's a photograph being taken uh, of us up upstairs uh, from, from the sky. And this photograph has a very, very coarse resolution. It's of the order of 250 meter uh, square pixel, depending upon what band you're looking at. Uh, <clears throat> and it generates, of course, massive amount of data. Now, once you have this data uh, uh, that is being picked up um, pixel by pixel, you can put it together, your geographers, uh, you can put it together and make a map, uh, which is what is shown uh, uh, on the middle uh, uh, lower uh, row, which middle column, uh, lower side. And then you can sort of see that if, if you put all of those pictures together that were taken on the same day, <clears throat> you have some sort of a map. And in this, in this particular map, what you're seeing is, uh, is a multispectral layer that has been collected, converted into some sort of an index of vegetation. You could do many, many different things. And, and, and the green, and it's sort of showing you how green a pixel is. And again, if you look at this middle picture here, you have a very good sense of where the, the big forested area might be. You see them all in, right in the equator, in Amazon, in Africa, in Indonesia. You can recognize all of the deserts, you can, um, and, and so forth, you can, and, 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 and so forth. So you can sort of see the, big, the, the overall picture in a, from a single snapshot. Now, if you look at any one of those pixels, locations and you watch its greenness over a period of time, you can construct a time series, which is what you have on the, on the right most corner. That is, this is the location which was going up and down uh, periodically every year using the annual cycle, becoming more green and less green every year. Uh, you, can, you might be able to see the vertical lines, which are the yearly boundaries. <clears throat> and then suddenly something happened and then of course the greenness went down uh, and so forth. This, happened to be, this happens to be the location uh, in China, I was giving this talk uh, in Beijing uh, at the National Convention Center in China, and I just picked up a time series for that location, and it sort of you can sort of see exactly when uh, uh, that convention center was built. So, and again, that's the MODIS, which is uh, uh, daily coverage, entire world at a coarse resolution. There are successive levels of higher and higher resolution data available, except that they are available at. Uh, they, they are, they are their, their final resolution in space, but coarser resolution in time. And one of the most important one is Landsat data, which is bi-weekly, every two, every two weeks you have a picture. It's a 30 meter resolution, which is much, much finer than the MODIS resolution, except that you only have a picture every two weeks, <clears throat> and, 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 and then you have it going for about 40 years. And, and of course, many satellites have been launched in the meantime, and there have different qualities and so forth, you have to deal with them. But the point is that a lot of data and of course, if you add this, aerial surveys, radar, LIDAR, and so forth, you have a very rich variety of data. But most of the work I'm going to talk about would involve only these kind of data sets. 
So once I have these data sets, you could sort of, as a computer scientist, uh, you could sort of look at this data and think of different ways of, uh, think of different problems to solve with it. And I'm going to talk about three different case studies depending upon time. One of them would involve unsupervised change reduction in the land cover uh, using the Modis time series data, which is the daily data uh, uh, that's coming in. Second uh, uh, application I hope to talk about is global mapping of fires in the forest ecosystems uh, and sort of show you how uh, this work has advanced beyond the state of the art. And the third project, uh, I'm going to show you early results on something we're embarking upon, which is the, the first global dynamics of water, uh, which is change, looking at all of the water bodies worldwide and seeing how they change. And of course, this is a, this, uh, that, that has importance for a lot of um, communities and a lot of people because a lot of water bodies involve rivers and rivers can grow and shrink. And then if you sort of know how these uh, rivers are growing and shrinking or the lakes are changing, you could sort of have a much better understanding of um, uh, the water availability and resources in the world and how they're being changed or impacted by um, you know, the climate or human actions. Depending on time, I'll, I'll sort of cover these applications in, in varying level of detail. Uh, from computer science perspective, um, uh, these data sets actually happen to be much more challenging in many ways than the ones uh, um, our community is used to dealing with in, in this big data community. We work with the internet scale data sets all the time. The data sets we work with happen to be sometimes even larger than these ones in other domains. But, but the problem here is that these data sets have a lot of noise, missing values, the quality could be very uh, poor. Uh, of, very often, there's no ground truth available for us to, to test things out. Uh, there's a variability in time because seasons change. Uh, there's a variability in space because the different locations have different behavior. Um, the, the thing that you're interested in, the phenomena, is very rare oftentimes. And the data and the phenomena can be viewed at multiple resolutions and multiple scale. That makes it very difficult to apply um, uh, textbook type algorithms to this problem. <coughs> so, the, as the satellites went up about 40 years ago, people started looking at the land cover change problem. And one of the dominant paradigm for land cover change detection has been, is if I look at two images, um, at, of the same location at two different times, I should be able to figure out what changed. So for example, if I look at this location, and if I look at this location in 2005, it looks like you know, sort of greenish. In 2009, it looks like sort of greenish, but there's some patches in the middle. I could sort of uh, figure out, that, yes, something happened here. Maybe the trees got cut, and it actually, this is a deforestation, uh, a location that was deforested. Now, to be able to do this kind of change reduction using this kind of methodology, you need a lots of high quality imagery, oftentimes something that you won't be able to get from Modis or, or, or Landsat. So you want high quality, high resolution data, which is uh, not available very frequently. Uh, you could fly a plane and, and look at this location at two different times, but you cannot go back 40 years ago and, 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 and get this picture. Uh, it requires training data to be able to distinguish between the, uh, the, the figures from the left and right if you want to do some automation here. As a result, these methodologies are used very extensively, but they are limited to small regions and are unable to identify change, a point but, but when the change might have happened, what is the rate of change, and so forth. So there are, this, this is a dominant methodology, but it's, 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 it cannot be used in a global sense. And everything that I'm going to talk about is, is going to be on techniques that can sort of circumvent these problems and the method that could be applied on a global scale. And just to give you a sense of why this may be feasible, you know, that is why is it that you know, here uh, in this picture, I have to look at these two very high quality pictures and then I could be able to tell something happened. Uh, and how could I work with MODIS, which has an extremely poor resolution, 250 meter square, which would mean the entire uh, square of uh, uh, College of Science and Engineering and Rapson Hall will be one pixel, I mean, this is a huge pixel, and if I'm only getting one bit out of this, what can I do with it? And I want to sort of show you this time series, which sort of shows you the greenness of a location somewhere in the world, uh, and you can sort of see the location goes back to 2000, you know, and it's a time series of about 10 years, and you can see this greenness goes up and down seasonally, you know, uh, somewhere it must be more green, winter less green, and suddenly something happened in the middle of 2007, the greenness came down. And then it took a few years for it to recover. 
Now, if, we, if you look at this and you know nothing about the location, what would sort of come to your mind as to what might have happened in this location? It, it, it's, it's very likely a fire. And indeed, it is. This happens to be a fire in California uh, uh, that sort of burned very rapidly. But it could also be deforestation. Somebody may, maybe came in there in, in this pixel, cut all the trees, and then the grass grew slowly or the trees grew slowly later on. So in any case, so you can sell a lot. It, it looks like something happened here, and it has some sudden reduction in vegetation. And it could be, of course, fire. It could be a few other things, but it's a, it's a good sense of what could be happening. Let's look at the other one. Uh, the time series on the uh, lower left corner. So vegetation, there is some greenness here, and then slowly going down, and then it's changing its behavior afterwards. What could it be? Infestation. Wow, that's, that's the second thing. Indeed, Colorado. The entire uh, uh, pine beetle forest west of Mississippi, going back all to the, uh, the west coast, have gone through tremendous change uh, over um, uh, the last decade or so, primarily because of uh, winters becoming not as cold as before. Uh, just the lowest temperature in winter going up by a few degrees, uh, and that has allowed the beetles, the bugs, to live <clears throat> farther up north uh, each year, and <laughs> that has sort of allowed them to infest these trees and, and really damage them. This is a very serious problem. And I'll give you another one uh, on the left side um, related to a change in the agriculture, and this is in Zambia. And you can sort of get a sense from here, that is, you can see this area, if you look at the picture around it, you see the big circles, these are the, the um, agriculture area that were sort of, uh, uh, this is the agriculture being done there, but you can sort of tell as to when that happened. It happened in 2005. Before 2005, all of the circles looked more like the surroundings, which is the bushes, undeveloped area. And a company came in and they sort of built these sort of high intensity farms. Uh, the name of the company happens to be Jam Beef, and it's sort of doing a good job there. So what I'm saying is that this is a technology that you can use not only to find out where the fires are or where the insect infestation is, but you can also use it to monitor agriculture in, in, in some ways. And, and of course, these are, uh, so this, is, this sort of shows you that even without knowing very much, by just looking at the time series of, of this data set that you can construct, you can do a lot. But, but these algorithms that we develop have to face a lot of challenges because they have to be robust to missing data, noise and outliers. They have to be able to handle the variability uh, in the data that would be uh, because of natural variations and spatial heterogeneity, and, and so forth. There are a lot of uh, different um, uh, issues that have to be uh, brought in. And this example I showed you may look very easy. It was, of course, the vegetation drop. Must be something happened. But there are 2 billion time series of 250 meter resolution globally. And every one of them looks different. Uh, I'm just showing you of a dozen or so there. But if you, what I'm saying is that if you come up with an algorithm, it often would break down on a larger scale because it will just create too many false positives. So the key challenge from a computational perspective is how do you design algorithms that have very low false positive rate, give you the pattern that you're looking for, and so forth. And I'm just going to give you uh, uh, not any details about the algorithm, but a result of some of these algorithms that are developed uh, in our group for finding the sudden drops, the gradual change, and the, the, the model change behavior to sort of see what we found globally. So, and I'm gonna show you a sample of results uh, on a global scale uh, uh, for analysis. We did, we did to build a platform uh, for monitoring the changes in the globe. And these changes are being done at a square kilometer level. That is every single pixel that you're seeing here is showing you change in an area which is about a square kilometer, which will have about 16 uh, modest pixels in it. Uh, and uh, globally, there are about 100 million such pixels. And uh, the set of algorithms we developed uh, found about a couple of million such changes. And I'm showing you on this Google Earth animation about uh, a sample of 20,000 of them, just to sort of give you a sense of what's happening globally. And I'll, I'm going to go through uh, some examples uh, individually, one by one. And you can sort of see fires in Australia. You can see fires in Indonesia. You can see Siberia up north changes there. Changes, land cover changes in Africa, 
uh, you, you will see South America changes coming up in just a minute and so forth. It's actually pretty fascinating to see this animation in different part of the world. And the one that I find most fascinating is this view of the globe from the north, uh, on top of the North Pole. You can see Alaska, uh, Canada on the, on, the, on the right side, and Siberia on the left side. And again, this is only a small sample of the, of the, of the locations. Each one of them, or I should say, vast majority of them, are, are fires in the, uh, in the forest ecosystem. And the frequency of these fires has gone up hugely over the last 10, 15 years, just because the, the winter temperatures have gone up by a couple of, lowest temperatures in winter have just gone up by a couple of degrees. Uh, and as a result, what people uh, think is that Today, the Canadian uh, forest ecosystem actually is a source of carbon as opposed to a sink of carbon. Forests are supposed to be a sink of carbon, and they are burning so rapidly that they have become a source of carbon, uh, which is which is pretty pretty amazing. And if you wanted to sort of see how these fires were detected in Canada, you can see the time series on the top left corner. Uh, it has this pattern, which is sort of going up and down, and suddenly, sometime it comes down, and it takes many many years to grow up. And when it comes down is exactly when the fire happens. The colors in this time series are showing the quality that is black is a good quality and others are of different varying quality. On the right side, you see a time series which is going down slowly, which is actually not because of insect damage, but because of deforestation. Areas are being sort of cleared up uh, uh, for, um, uh, uh, you know, for, for logging. On the top, on the bottom left side, you see a gold mine being constructed in Tanzania. It was happened to be constructed in, in protected forests. We, we got a map from United Nations Development Foundation saying, hey, here are the protected forests. Can you find some changes here? And then this, this was one of the changes that popped up. And actually, not only we can find these change, but we can map the entire construction of mine. Uh, that is, it started in 2002, and then it sort of, this is how it developed. Which areas got developed when? You can literally map them one by one. On the, Right bottom side, what you're seeing is the deforestation mapping in the, in the Brazilian rainforest uh, in the state of Mato Grosso, which is called the capital of deforestation, in the sense that that's where the much of the deforestation has happened, where people have sort of taken uh, the large forests, converted them to soybean farming. Um, and, and of course, you can see the time series, and, and, and this sort of gives you the sense of how the change might have happened. And what I like to show is an animation of, how, I mean, this is sort of, this is the mapping audience. So you can sort of take these changes that we constructed and you can put them on a map and you can see the dynamics. And there is a timer running on the top. So you can see this area deforested over a period of 12 years, starting in 2000. And you can see that ring forming right around this, this the arc of deforestation. You can see exactly how it started and where it grew and, and so forth. You can map the entire dynamics. So, so you know, this is about building maps. I guess it uh, um, uh, gives you a sense of what you could do with this technology. I'll just show a few more examples of, uh, for illustration. On the top left side, you see a lake in Africa, Lake Chad, a very large lake. It grew, it shrank considerably because of human impact. I guess people were di diverting water uh, that was coming uh, from the river to the lake. And, um, on the top right side, you see the changes being picked up uh, uh, near uh, New Orleans. It, basically, you're able to map the entire damage done by uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, you can sort of see how many square kilometers of vegetation got damaged, um, how long it took to recover. You can sort of see the time series and, and, and actually get a very good sense of that. You can see the river dynamics, uh, river being flooded in uh, Siberia. And then on the bottom right side, actually, is a very interesting story. Uh, some of you may have followed this uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, they went through a lot of upheaval uh, in, their, um, uh, in, in the farming sector uh, in about 2002 onward. Uh, Mugabe, uh, the president, allowed people to grab land. So basically, there are farmers who, who were industrial scale farmers doing large scale farming. And it used to be very productive land. They would export a lot of food. And around 2002, people started taking those land, and then the productivity changed so dramatically that it's an importer of food now. And then, of course, Mugabe sort of would say that nothing happened. Uh, the, the food problem we're having is international conspiracy. But using this technology, you can actually map every single location and figure out exactly what was going on 
until what date and when, when this land was taken by somebody. So this happens in the location uh, uh, time series for the location for which was picked up in 2004. If you see the collection of all the points that we mapped, you can see when it started, when it ended, and, and, and how it spread. It's actually pretty fascinating to be able to do this automatically. Modus, yes. Oh, oh, so, so the, the time series is the modest time series, right? And whatever location were found to be changed, I put them, we, we put them on, on, on the map. That, exactly, that's right. So each of the dots is picked up by the algorithm. So if you look at the entire uh, state, the entire country of uh, uh, Zimbabwe, you know, there are you know, there'll be millions of points, and then you can find out which tens or hundreds of thousands of locations that got changed. And you can map them. You can show them. Uh, you can show the you can show the animation. You can sort of see how it changed year over by year. You can see that some 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 location got picked up first, and then people who lost the farm, then the neighbors lost their farms after that because I guess people became bold that they can I can take this right, and then the next one ran away because they thought that somebody will take my land too. So you can see the growth. It's pretty fascinating. There's a paper that's being written on this dynamics uh, as we speak. So uh, that's made feasible by this analysis. Uh, I was just giving this talk in uh, uh, Taiwan earlier uh, this summer. And, and this sort of shows you that not only you can sort of look at the agricultural changes, but you can also look at the damage uh, due to uh, uh, natural disaster. So and this happens to be a massive uh, flood that happened in Taiwan. And actually, you know, I don't have to look at the date. I can look at the time series, and I know the, the flood happened around 2000, you know, 4, 2005 time frame. And uh, you can literally, so basically I'm picking up vegetation changes, but I can put those points back on the map and figure out exactly where the changes happen. And there's a story here, which sort of say typhoon, Morocot, basically caused all of this damage. On the left side, you see in the, on the, the Taiwan Peninsula, uh, on, on the island, where exactly the changes happen. And you can see up on the top right that it, the points that were detected by the algorithm are sitting at the right places if you look at the Google imagery. Well, this is actually this, this is a different uh, typhoon in 2009. All of these changes that we found, as I mentioned to you, we did the analysis, uh, were put into a system called Automated Land Change Evaluation Reporting and Tracking System. Uh, this, is, this was sort of done in collaboration with Planetary Institute. And, uh, and, and this work actually was presented at the uh, uh, Climate Change Summit in Cancun in 2010. Uh, uh, and economists did actually a very nice story on this work to sort of show that monitoring uh, on a global scale can be very, very expensive. Brazilians spend about $100 million a year to monitor their forest. And technology uh, that we developed here uh, at the University of Minnesota using big data techniques uh, has has an opportunity to be able to do this much much more cheaply. So this was this was sort of the unsupervised mapping of changes on the globe, uh, and and to sort of show you how a diverse set of changes can be picked up, um, uh, and hopefully some of them are of interest to you. Second application, I promise you three applications. Uh, second application I'm going to talk about is very specifically mapping of locations in the fire that got burned globally. Because this is very, very important uh, from the, uh, the fires are important uh, source of greenhouse emissions. They have impact on flora, fauna, air quality. Uh, and of course, they're important for climate change studies, uh, management of the forest itself, and, 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 and so forth. Now, what, what do people do for building these maps of fire? Uh, they can do aerial field surveys. Uh, it's infeasible globally. California, by the way, uh, keeps a very good track of their fires. Uh, so they have uh, really good quality data for all of the fires going back more than 10 years. You could look at the composites uh, of Landsat or other satellite data manually and figure out what areas look different and call them burn, which is, of course, uh, not feasible within globally, labor intensive. And then you can have satellite products. Uh, there is a product actually called Modis Active Fire, which is a... Uh, a band which you which is specifically there on, on, on the satellite to check if, if if there's a thermal anomaly is if an area is looking more hot than usual and that is supposed to pick up these fires it's just called active fire product 
but it has too many false alarms and misses. I mean, it, it has tremendous value for real-time fight, firefighting uh, purposes, but to build a, a sort of a, a atlas of what might have happened in the past, it's not very good. And there are, because of the importance of this, this uh, 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 objective, NASA spent a lot of money on it, and there are a series of products from NASA, MCD45, GFED, that sort of, these are the research groups funded in remote sensing to build these products to figure out what, what location they have got. Now, the, and of course, this, this, these guys, uh, towards the end, have built some sort of predictive models. Now, what are the predictive models? Well, these are the same predictive models that uh, uh, would classify your email, whether it's a spam or not, uh, whether your transaction uh, uh, is a fraudulent or not. Uh, you go to Facebook and if you put a picture and somebody, it will tag you know, who, who the person is. These are all uh, methods for predicting something. And how do these predictive models work? Well, they work with some sort of a label data. That is, you have data sets for which you have attributes, data instances for which you have attributes, and a label. You give me some sort of labels uh, and attributes. I will use them to build a model, and I can use that uh, uh, to classify uh, unseen data sets. And of course, regression works on the same principle. You give me some attributes, some target values. I'll build a, a model, and then that minimizes the, the error, and then I can use the regression model to make prediction. Now, the trouble uh, with this framework is, in, to be able to use it in the cost of the forest fire, is that the entire uh, the, the, the forest ecosystems are so diverse from place to place that you can't build single model for all of them. And if you build model for one, it probably won't work uh, uh, for a different region. Second thing is, for most of the world, we don't have training data. For California, for example, we have very good quality training data. So, so you can use the data to train our models and perhaps uh, use it in the future. But for the rest of the world, uh, it's very, very poor. Australia has labels, but they're extremely poor labels. So, which means if I have no labels, then, then I'm stuck because my uh, training data set does not have the labels. And if I don't have the labels in training data, I'm out of luck with my predictive model methodology. And the other problem is that the instances that I'm looking for are rare, in the sense that most locations on most days don't burn, thankfully, uh, which means even if my algorithm has uh, very high accuracy, it could create enough false positives that it could be useless for application. So we have built a, a novel methodology, and I won't have time to talk about it, uh, but I'll just give you sort of a higher level uh, picture here. It makes use of no gold standard table data set. That is, I don't need anything in terms of exactly uh, what the right labels are, which is the good part. It actually exploits the fact that it's a rare class problem, that is the phenomenon of interest is rare, and it leverages concepts like guilt by association, spatial autocorrelation, uh, uh, to, to make use of, uh, and it sort of uses all of these concepts together to build a global uh, machinery that can work globally. And again, I won't have time to tell you what the machinery is, but I will show you a uh, result of this study uh, on a global scale. So I'm going to show you results for a period from 2004 to 2010. It, it requires some unsupervised data collection for four years. So that's why the study started in 2004. The performance of this methodology matches the performance of a classifier that uses gold standard labels, where the standard labels are available. For example, for California, this methodology would do just as well uh, if I also knew the actual labels. But the good thing is that it also works very well in areas where the labels are not available. Now, you sort of ask me, well, how well does it do if I don't have the, the labels? How do you know it does very well, right? So I'm gonna sort of try to, to convince you uh, as to what does that last bullet means here, okay? I'm gonna take a case study uh, for Indonesia. And specifically, I'm gonna look at the locations in this box. Uh, and this area burns quite frequently uh, uh, when it burns massive fires happen, and uh, far away in Singapore, the haze can be seen. I, mean, I was talking to somebody on the phone a month and a half ago, and they sort of said there's a lot of haze outside. Why? Because there's a fire in Indonesia. So it's like this is a, this is a nuisance uh, beyond, of course, the impact on carbon. Uh, so in this location, in this area, uh, we found lots of changes. Each of these dots here is a change, uh, a square kilometer pixel found by the algorithm. You still don't know with how good they are. Now, if I pick up one of those points and show you how the time series changes, you might have a little bit more confidence. 
you can sort of see that uh, uh, the time series goes up and down, and suddenly uh, one day it comes down and goes up. So that's, ex that's exactly when the fire happened. If I take a whole bunch of locations and take the time series and map them on top of each other, you will see that all of them are going at the same time, which is a perfect signature fire because it's synchronized. A lot of locations will go down at the same time because the fire burns uh, very, you know, very rapidly. Now, uh, now I'm comp comparing with the, 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 the state-of-the-art product from NASA. And in each of these blocks, I am coloring it by sort of showing you how many locations, how many points are found, how many square kilometers are found by our algorithm that were missed by the NASA state-of-the-art algorithm. Red means uh, we found a lot more, and green means they found more. And this tells you exactly what those points look like. So all of the red points look like the left, top left signal. That is, things burn. They stayed burned for many, time, many years. It took many years to recover. And the top and the right ones look more like uh, the lower ones in which they burned and they quickly recovered. The lower phenomena happens in locations that are really not forest, the agriculture. So a little bit of biomass burned and it came back up. So the top one is actually the most significant one. Now, how much did we uh, pick up? 20,000 square kilometers of area that was burned in Indonesia. This is the prime land for tropical forest, right? Was, was not picked up by the NASA State of the Art product. Globally, if you look at the entire band in the tropical belt, 60,000 square kilometer area equal to the entire Switzerland. Uh, and it almost doubled the estimate of the state of the art product. So this is like, a, this changes the, the carbon cycle equation very, very significantly. And this sort of shows that, yes, you can apply these algorithms and then get some of these results. Aha, uh, uh -huh. very, very uh, interesting dynamics in Indonesia. Uh, and all of these answers are true. Uh, one of, and I'll give you the culprit, the nature as being the culprit. Um, in early New Year's, you see a lot more of these fires. Okay? The ocean warms up in the Pacific, uh, causes drought, uh, uh, dryness in Indonesia, and the farming practices there, normal farming practices are such that when they farm, at the end they will just burn the produce, but then the wind would blow, and then that wind would sort of burn the, the trees nearby. So, so that, that there's a climate connection there. There's a human connection, there's also this uh, palm oil deforestation connection. So there are multiple connections there. This is something that you, you know, Norwegians finally gave, committed to give billions of dollars a year to Indonesia to, to sort of not uh, deforest these trees because this is the biggest disaster you can imagine for the humanity. All right, so now uh, I have only a few minutes left. So what I want to do is uh, talk about the third application, but I'll talk about it very quickly rather than talking about a lot of the motivation, but I'll sort of tell you exactly uh, what we were able to achieve. So water, of course, is critical. I don't have to convince anybody. Uh, um, and it's and the problem with climate change is that it's getting more and more, even the amount of water isn't changing, but its location, uh, I mean, its heterogeneity is changing. So we see more droughts and more uh, floods. So basically, uh, we, are, we are seeing a lot more uh, of the water stress situation. And I'm just going to go through um, uh, this slide here, that is, if you want to do management of water, you have to be able to measure it. And there is a tremendous lack of information about the global water resources. Number one, a lot of people, a lot of countries, a lot of uh, organizations do not have a lot of information about water resources. And if they do, they will not share them across national boundaries. So if you want to sort of know globally what's happening to uh, the water resources in the world, it's very difficult uh, to, to, to find those estimates or, or the status. So what we're talking about here is you being able to use the data from Modis and Landsat, which of course uh, uh, I've talked about briefly, and try to see if we can use data from these to build the dynamics of how the water situation has been changing over the last many, many decades. And uh, what I'm gonna show you is uh, the fact that this is a very, very difficult problem because just like forests, the water bodies actually are even more heterogeneous. I'm just showing you examples of lakes uh, or water bodies in different parts of the world, in Egypt, in Africa, in Argentina, and so forth. And they'll all look different, and they all look different at different times. The lake below in Argentina looks one way in, in 2000, completely different in 2012. 
So the nature of land, nature of water could look different on different days, which means if I use the traditional methods of building predictive models, give me labels and I'll build a model, they just break down. And they break down to the extent that the, if I use the best uh, methods for predictive model, and I'm just showing you the false color composite on the left side, is if I look at the multispectral data, it looks like this. And I can visually figure out where the water is. And if I use my best uh, predictive model and build a map, I, I build a map on the right side. Blue means water, green means not water. And you can sort of see that these, this map isn't very good. And of course, on some days, the map would be very good, but some days it would be pretty bad. And, and, and that means you will not have a good sense of what the dynamics is. That's one problem. This is actually a huge problem. The other thing is, and there's one way to possibly solve this problem is if I have a perfect, if I have the elevation data, I can actually solve a lot of the problems. Because if I know elevation data on the ground, then I know the higher location on the ground cannot be water before the lower location or water. Right? This is the plain physics. But I don't have the elevation information, certainly not at the level of detail that I need <clears throat> to be able to map the water dynamics globally. And it turns out that it's possible uh, to build a methodology, and this is sort of, I'm going to show you results of that, which can handle the heterogeneity in the world, and without using the information, there's a typo here, without using the elevation information, it sort of tried to reconstruct it and re-estimates it. Uh, and I'm going to show you the examples, and these are the animations that were put together yesterday, and let's hope they work. So what you're seeing here is uh, uh, examples of water bodies from different worlds. There are about 10,000 water bodies like these that each of them have about 10 square kilometer or more area. And of course, a lot of these water bodies happen to be parts of rivers that have been dammed. They, they were dammed. And you can sort of see by watching this machinery as to when the dam was built. So you see on the top left corner, you see a time series. Uh, and you can see the location of the time series. It's very low for most of it because the river was very narrow. A dam was built. And, and, the, and then it becomes, of course, the, uh, the area covered by water becomes much larger, and it's, uh, it becomes cyclic. What you're seeing in the animation is the time between the two red lines. On the right side in uh, Sudan, uh, another dam was built. Uh, and you can see uh, that this dam sort of had, was built a long time ago. And more recently, they extended this dam. They increased the height uh, by certain meters, and the dam became, you know, the area became much larger. So you basically, Sitting in your office, you can sort of figure out how many dams were built, when they were built, what area uh, they're co covering, what is, how's the, the water uh, resources changing around them, and so forth. Uh, and just to sort of show you that these pictures are not just fake, uh, I have the animation running on the left side for one of the maps, and I have the <coughs> digital elevation map on the right side, and of course, elevation map is sitting underneath this one too. And you can see that as this water body is growing and shrinking, it's growing and shrinking at just the right location, even though it has no information about the elevation. And that's sort of what makes it interesting from methods perspective. And of course, once you have this, you can sort of use it uh, for understanding interplay between water resources, uh, climate change, human impact. You could perhaps project water use and availability. And, and more importantly, these rivers uh, uh, networks, how these river networks are changing, uh, impacting each other. Um, uh, you can sort of build these networks very, very easily uh, uh, from this technology. So with that, I'm going to stop. I think I'm almost running out of time. Uh, that advances in spatial temporal data analytics, which is exactly what we do, hold great promise for understanding global change. And, uh, and of course, I don't have to tell you this, because geographers work with spatial data all the time. That is, these data sets come across in so many different domains uh, that uh, not only you can use this technology for ecosystem management, but for epidemiology, location-based services, geospatial intelligence, and so forth. So tremendous opportunity here for, uh, for, for applying these techniques. Let me just uh, thank you all and also mention uh, uh, my collaborators and students uh, uh, in this large project. Thank you.